So um, this session is on record now. And I, want, I would like to use this opportunity to say Please. welcome to the another edition of Art Education, Art Educators Hangout. Uh, this is another Please. opportunity to share from um, someone who is uh, faceta in the field. That is volume, please, volume, volume. Okay. Okay, you can hear me clearly, Very sir. Very low. Okay. Low. Oh, sorry. I guess the network from my side. I'm very sorry about that. I try, I've tried to increase the volume, and I'm very sorry about that. And I don't know if uh, Professor Olude can take the uh, introduction then because of the challenges I'm having here. I think the volume is okay on my side, but um, I'm gladly uh, willing to do that. Thank you. Uh, okay, it's a very brief introduction from my side, as we will know more of Larry uh, Jackson as he makes his presentation this afternoon. Um, I would want to say that the universe brought us all together, <laughs> you know, the way things work. Um, I met Larry through Holly, who made a presentation last week, and Holly and I have been having conversations uh, back and forth for quite a while over Instagram. Um, I'm pleased to introduce Larry Jackson today as a designer, maker, educator. Larry Jackson makes enduring art education projects, concepts, and experiences. A school of visual arts, fine artist, schooled in illustration professionally, Larry has worked with great clients on numerous collaborative projects. With work experiences from the likes of Gap, Banana, Republic, um, doing branding and presentation design, um, Lord and Taylor, Saks Fifth Avenue, as a window display concepts um, artist, to design, um, installing and curation of projects with Johnny Mitchell, Pratt Manhattan Gallery, Larry works in all media. Currently, he works as the creative director of a new streaming television network, Urban Music Report, also known as UMR. Passion leads to quenching his curiosity, resourcefulness, and inquisitive nature. And that is what led him to arts education. His residency at the Park Avenue Armory is the perfect place to use his professional knowledge, experiences, and resources to inspire up and coming students and educators alike. So with that, I'm introducing formally Larry Jackson, our speaker for today. Thank you. Thanks. Um, first thing I'd like to do is just thank everybody for giving me this offer to be here. This has been pretty fun preparing for uh, what we're going to do. I wanted to start off by uh, just uh, talking a little bit about how it is that I work. I work primarily by recreating what my experiences are like while I'm actually doing my professional work. Um, and I bring that into my classrooms. So my students are usually tasked with, first of all, forming a group who they'd like to work with or who they never have worked with before. What that does is that that makes them understand that sometimes you're not in control. I like to have the teacher become the person that puts those groups together. And it's really great if the students haven't worked together and they're unfamiliar with each other. As the projects go along, and usually projects are 10 weeks or so, as the projects go along, the students start to coalesce and become very, very involved and become more free to understand what it's like to communicate. I also want to say that the projects that I work on are really not the whole idea of what it is I'm doing. A great deal of what I like about doing teaching art is that the actual uh, process is the artwork for me. I think the students will realize that later on after the work is done. It may not hit them until, you know, it could be a year later, it could be a couple of hours later after class, but I think it's something that resonates with them once they look back on what took place and also what they can recall, what they learn as they're looking at what they're doing. 
visual arts is great because it's tangible evidence of being there. And I find that to be the one thing that I want to always recreate with the students. If you have an idea, it's just this floating thing that's inside your head. And it's great to actually see it come alive and become something that uh, lives in fruition so that everyone else can pick up on it and see what's happening. Um, I'd like to share my screen now. And then I'm, what I'm going to do is just go through a bunch of artworks and uh, then we can actually talk about it. I will talk over the artworks as we're, we're looking through them. Um, so how do I share? Uh, the share button, can you hear me? Yeah, I hear you. Okay, the share button is that arrow at the center. Just click on it, then yeah. you can share your, uh, when you click on it, so it will bring option, then you can share your desktop. So everything on your desktop will appear, uh, will be visible to all of us. Okay, so I press on that. I want to show my desktop. Just go. Um, right. So if I go to my desktop right now, you'll be able to see it. Can you see what's going on right now? Not yet. Yeah, I've not started Wait. sharing. You need to click on, you need to, you can go back to the team. There's an arrow. When you click on the arrow, okay, now you, you we, can, we can see your screen now. Yeah. Very good. Okay. Very good. All right. Very can good. you see that? Yes. Yes. Okay. Uh, I wanted to show you something that took place uh, probably 10 or 15 years ago. I entered into a classroom where I was going to be working with older students, older students, 10th, 11th, 12th graders. And we had eight classes to create something. That first class when I entered into the classroom, the students didn't really speak and they didn't communicate. Um, they basically like looked at me and I found that to be a little disconcerting because part of the problem was they were sizing me up. I was coming in with a purity of like, let's get busy, but they had to go through their process of sizing me up. What I did after I left the class, I was taking the subway back home and as I drew a picture of what I thought about that class. I felt like everyone had a mask on and I felt like the next class I'm going to have to realize that every class I go into, I'm just going to have to come in and demask them with something that's going to impress them, but also buy them um, the reality that they have to participate. It's important for them to participate. So this was the illustration that I did for that. And that was something that I thought about and I keep that to my core every time I walk into a classroom. I want them to be on top of the idea that they are going to be participating and that it's very important for them to participate and be in control of what's going to take place. This is, um, I'll just go through these projects and uh, we can talk about them as we go. This is a project where I have a group of people who are in second grade. Um, and what I like to do is introduce projects where they have to do something that they feel relevant, that they feel is relevant to them. So what I like to do is create a project where they have to uh, design their name. And for this project, the students had to design their name and they did it in a couple of different stages and they had no idea what was going to happen with the design, but they had to come up with a color. They had to come up with the, uh, the letter forms and then they had to come up with a shape that represented what they really felt comfortable with to go around the name. And this was the beginning of design to them. Second graders are really interesting in that sense. They don't really understand what design is, but once they got into it, they started getting very involved with um, paying attention to the details of what colors they chose and what they wanted it to look like. By class number three, I introduced the fact that the name was going to be um, put onto a giant piece of paper. I was going to take it to a copy machine and blow it up and that they would be actually painting their names. And then we would have like a whole series of these names so that I can know who they are. By week five, I knew everybody's name based on looking at their copies and making copies of their stuff. And these are some of the, the actual designs that they made. Now, what I like about this kind of project is, as you can see with this person right over here, she has her name, but she also wanted to be known as number seven for some reason. And I'm thinking about it now, and it's probably because she was looking at something that um, 
that had a number seven and she re it resonated with her. And I allowed her to do that because I talked about the fact that nicknames are real important in some cultures. When I was growing up, my nickname was Wildcat, by the way. Um, and so I allowed them to do that. And a lot of the other students fell in line with that. Now, because she was one of the first ones that created her actual name and did a really nice job with it, I allowed her to go to the next step and create another thing to go along with it. And if she wanted to make an image to go along with the design, she could do that as well. What this did was just give them a, a sense of like being in control of the whole thing. And uh, these are basically those sketches for that kind of project. Now that's one project and that's with second graders. When I started working with the teacher, the teacher wasn't really um, sure that they could actually understand what was going on. They did a really successful job of that. Um, I'll go to the next project. I do a lot of architecture. These are third graders and this is architecture in which um, again my students are in a group and what they like to do is have a lot of talk going on but what I have them do is look at architecture in books and in magazines, choose something and then we recreate what it is that they've looked at in a way where they actually have to add some sort of original idea to it. So they work in design teams and as they're working in design teams they have conversations about what they're going to do to alter it. They make sketches and they come up with really really great ideas. This 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 group was making like a, a barn based on like old time houses. That's how they described it and um, they did a wonderful job. This is basically just working with paper. If you can see right over here this is the grass they asked me if they could, if I could bring in grass, and I, I actually couldn't find anything to replicate grass. But I did go to a copy shop, and I copied some photos of grass, and I brought them like a stack of papers that they cut up to actually make the grass out of. And you can see they just went about the whole process of doing their thing. Uh, what's really great about this is that they work in their little teams. They have their table, they have all the supplies they need. They're free to walk around the room if they want to. This shows some of the references that they were looking at for their ideas for the things that they're doing. Uh, and basically, I pretty much give them the freedom to choose whatever type of building that they want to choose, but they have to stick to it over the course of the next eight to 10 weeks to come to finishing it. This is one of the last classes. Uh, it, during the last class, I believe that the students should have um, some sort of culminating event. Uh, but lately what I've been doing is culminating events where I invite parents and I invite people who know them. Um, and I also invite, as you can see, there's other grown-ups in the rooms. These are grown-ups that were actual from an architecture firm that was down the block. And um, a couple of these people, this was my agent at the time, uh, a couple of these people uh, were really, really wonderful because they, they helped the kids along with different ideas of what they were going through and what they were doing. They talked to them about how architecture works and they had these great conversations. And um, it's great to have the kids have somebody that's a stranger come in and observe what it is that they're making and what they're doing because it just really fortifies their confidence and they, um, the decisions that they made throughout the whole process of doing what it is that they were doing. Um, the other thing is that it was really nice to have the students take the photos of these projects. I rarely photograph what's in the classroom. I hand out cameras to the students and I let them tell me the story of what's going on throughout the residency. I look at the photos every uh, after I leave the class and I sort of uh, just get it all together towards the end to create a project like this where I can show them a, a photo slideshow or a film or something like that that shows their ideas all in action all together. Um, so that's that's the joy of architecture. I love the fact that it incorporates all different types of art materials to work with as well as all different um, types of art to work with uh, in terms of like academia. This project is a bridge project and it's a bridge project in two ways. For me it's about sculpture. For the students it's about working as a team to doing something that they could probably not envision on their own but it's something that's very recognizable. So when you say the word bridge to these students they understand what it is because right outside their window there was the Brooklyn Bridge. 
So we did sketches and we took those sketches and we made uh, like an aggregate of like some of the ideas from the bridge. And then we actually created the bridge. Now these guys are second grade uh, and they, they have like about four different languages in the class. So I found that to be something that could be an obstacle. But what I found that I could do was I could work with the whole class and describe the whole class as a company. And I was actually the contractor working with them and they were going to be subcontracted to do various jobs. In this case right here, these guys are making the railings for the bridge. So they're making like what's got to be done here. What I did was I made a prototype of it and this is foam core and I brought in toothpicks, glue and um, some cut foam. And I had a team of five kids that were in this department. They were part of the, uh, the, the, the road rail crew. So what they had to do was actually make the rail for the whole bridge. They spent about probably two classes getting this correct and making it look really, really great and consistent. Uh, that's part of the charm of this kind of thing. This crew was actually making the stanchions for the bridge. These are the things that are gonna hold the bridge up and they were basically going to paint it and they were going to uh, put it onto the boards and make sure that it's in the correct position that it's supposed to be in. And uh, they worked great as a team. Now they're working totally separately in the same classroom as the other group. And one of the cool things about that is that they can go over to the other group and consult with the group about where they're at. So that when these things come together, they can agree that we're gonna do it over here on the floor or on this desk or whatever. And uh, it's pretty magical to watch all of this go together. So these are just photos of them actually getting all together to put part of it together. Um, and we're pretty much going through the process of it, showing what's going on and getting it in the right place, gluing it up, talking about what we need to do for the next week or whatever, and really, really having a great deep consultancy with the, um, the young people. It's really great to see the motivation of students that don't talk or were not known to be talkers to actually talk and really, really share what they're thinking about and take the reins on various things such as gluing, painting, putting things together. This is the final product of that project. Uh, and for the end of this project, we did have the parents come in and actually uh, look at what they were doing and discuss it. And that was really a fun share to go through. Um, I've had the joy of having a residency at a private school. This is the bridge uh, between two school systems. The other school systems that you saw were the school systems that are public schools here in New York City. This is my private school. And these classes are a little bit more advanced in terms of like their younger kids. These are actually before kindergartners. Um, and they're making what's called the clock project because they would always ask me what time it was and I decided we were going to make clocks. So we, we figured out, I figured out that they should make projects that would be beneficial for them to learn something by. So this was a clock project um, that they were doing. And basically what I did was find clock parts. I think I went to Walmart and found the insides of clocks and then they had to come up with a shape and actually make the shape and then we put it all together. Um, included in this kind of class is classes where I ask the, I actually have them make their uh, their names um, and I'll show you one of those something like this right here it's a three-dimensional class where they have to cut out shapes and then put them together and make an enlargement of what their names are these are fun exercises for these students but it's also fun for me one of the joys of working at a private school is that you have an unlimited amount of and as you have that what happens is you start to realize that kids are pretty much the same everywhere you go. Um, getting into my older students, I wanted to uh, show you one of the coolest projects that we worked on. This was a project called the Runaway Slave Project. And with this project, the students had to um, read some passages in books about the process of slavery and how it came to the states. And then they had to make pictures or drawings, and then they had to make like a final poster based on what um, we had found were uh, advertisements that were put into the 
newspapers in New York City. And those advertisements were for bounties for slaves that had run away from the South. A lot of people never talked about this, but the joy of this project was that it shined a light on this subject that was really, really interesting. In the North of America, there were slaves that would um, be picked up in their freedom or their idea of freedom. And these stories, uh, these slaves were picked up because they were bounties placed in newspaper and the bounties um, gave a description of what the slaves are or what they look like. So we had the students read about some of those bounties and try and figure out what the actual uh, newspapers were saying about the people. And so these were the final pieces of like what they were talking about. And the descriptions, I wish I had them with me. They were, they were wonderful because they were really, really descriptive uh, things about the actual slaves. And I found them to be really interesting for the students to read that and to parse that information and to come up with what they felt or what their summary of what that person was about based on their name, their description of what color they were, and uh, how you know it looked physically, and so these were some of those images. Uh, working with cut paper and crayons, and I think uh, a little bit of marker. These are pretty wonderful. Later on during that project, we actually had the students make their own version of the the posters, as if they were making posters to post into the newspapers. And so you get to see like some of the words that they found on the posters that they they chose to, to put there, along with the imagery. It was a powerful program. It went for three years and it was a granted program. And uh, we had a real good time with that. Um, I'm going to go over to, again, these are older students. And I just wanted to show some of the projects that I've worked on with them. These are t-shirt designs. These guys had to come up with slogans that they felt comfortable with. These were like uh, fifth graders or fourth graders, I think. And uh, you can see some of the things that they, they came up with. Interesting um, tidbits. They had to write about why they did what they did. Again, as with my working with my design teams in my professional life, I wanted them to have like a form that would explain what it was they were trying to come up with when they created their projects. Um, T-shirts are a great process and a great project to work with uh, with students at any age, um, especially when you're working with something that they create originally. I wouldn't allow them to use anything from um, uh, an, an existing T-shirt design. I really wanted them to be original and think about what that process is. This is again with the Buckley School and again with three dimensions. I just wanted to express how important it is to have the kids have the freedom to work with materials. In this case, we were just making things out of foam. They had never worked with foam before, but they found it to be transfixing. And I found it to be a joy to like have them play with it, uh, make shapes. We cut out the shapes and then we painted them and sand them. And then they choose what their projects are. So. This person here wanted to make his nickname, which was G-Man. And uh, this one wanted to make something for a football team. It was a logo, and he wanted to make a clock based on an earlier project that he had worked on. These are second graders, second and third graders. Um, and these are pretty, pretty fun projects. I still run into a lot of these students because when I'm in the Upper East Side where the school is, it's right next to another one of my clients and I see them on the street. They are now eighth graders, seventh and eighth graders. And I can ask them where your clock is. And they, they always tell me that they still have the clock and it's in my room or wherever, you know, it's really, really a great sort of um, thing to do something that they can take with them and something that's tangible and utilitarian. That's very important. Um, this project is with older students. These students were having a prom. This was an after school program. They had me as sculpture, uh, sculpture design teacher, and we had done a play before, so they understood the, the, uh, the mechanics of what kind of materials we would work with. Their theme was old Hollywood, so we designed what the actual, um, what the actual, what the actual uh, place would look like in presentation form. So they wanted to have an Oscar, which we actually made. We made the base for the Oscar, all out of foam, 
This is uh, insulation foam. You can buy it at Home Depot in large sheets, easy enough to cut. You can cut it with a knife or you can cut it with just a basic saw. And uh, they painted them up and we sort of like got it all together and designed the Hollywood sign to go along with that. And I was actually invited to go to the prom with them, which was really sort of a wonderful thing. So they made their Hollywood sign. This is it in the hallway before it went to where it had to go. And this is the actual event, which was really, really wonderful. These were, I think they were eighth graders and they were graduating, uh, going to a bigger school. All right, I think I got two or three more projects here. One of the latest projects that I've been working with um, is one called the Historical Trading Cards Project. Again, I wanted to express what it's like to work with the idea of something tangible. These students had to make cards based on the idea of a trading card, but they had to make it uh, based on somebody from their life. So they had to choose somebody and then they had to put the statistics of the person on the back of the card. They could also make, take a photo and they could also decorate the card in any way, fashion or form that creates um, a reality of what that person meant to them. So this was what they came up with. And it's really, really sort of neat in how we went through the process. These are the sketches that they had to do the front and the back of. Once they got their prototypes done, they colored them in. Then they started making them. This is one of the finished ones. Um, another one, which is great. Um, the stories on the back were amazing for these projects. Uh, they told a lot about who they were and they were really, really sort of captivating to check out. And this is a great project for um, students that are, you know, in sixth, seventh, eighth grade. It can be younger, but it's really nice when it's relevant to that. I want to cross over to the digital divide because I think it's very important to understand that like uh, all of those projects are dealing with uh, what you just saw. We're dealing with the idea of working with um, working with tangible art supplies. These are students that are in third grade and they are working with the digital software called ArchiCAD, which I work with. ArchiCAD is a software program uh, used by professionals. And uh, my students are tasked with coming up there, <laughs> coming up with their designs and making a really beautiful design that actually captures their idea of what a house could be. Uh, they work in design teams. This is a design team. That's their finished house. She was sort of the boss and she knew what was going on. These guys were funny. Um, really, really great. They do a wonderful job of this. It takes them two weeks to learn the idea of like how to work with the software, but they start off by making sketches. They also look at model of architecture like these right here to get ideas of what their structures are going to come out like. And this is how we start off the process of them thinking outside the box, literally outside the box, the cross pollination of architecture and three dimensional design coming from the um, idea of working with it on a computer is really, really great. Uh, some of the students that we work with will probably never work in this form because they start off with everything on a computer. I don't agree that that's the right way to go. I think they need to start with sketches and they need to do something like this. These prototypes work to like see your ideation out and to come up with um, clear cut, concise ideas of what's going on. Once they're working on their project, this is a school that they actually had one to one individuals that can work on their computers and uh, it's really fun to watch them go through the process of it. Again, design teams sometimes are really great for this, but once they've got it, um, got the knack of it, they do a great job of doing their own. Um, and these are just a couple more of those shots of those kind of projects right there. It's great when the teachers can walk over or other students can walk over and they can look at what they're doing and talk about it, help each other out. I usually don't over explain. I, I ask them to do one or two things. And if one of them knows how it's done, I ask them to be the helpers to help the others to learn how to do it. And so we have a lot of that going on in the classroom. And that's really important. These are some of the final projects starting from the sketches. And I think I'll stop here, but I just want to show you at the end of this, the most important thing. The last class, I have the parents 
their little brothers and sisters and everybody they know come into the classroom for the photo op. This is what I call the photo op class. And uh, we take photos of them and they walk their parents through their process and the project. Um, they show them how to do the walkthroughs. And this is probably my favorite thing out of all the, uh, the digital architecture things that we've been doing. Um, I think I'll stop right there because I want to hear commentary. And I know that's an overwhelming amount, but I think it's, it's, a, it's a richness that we can like have a little bit of talk and questioning. Okay. For me, I would I love you to continue because I was actually enjoying every <laughs> bit of it. Because uh, this is this is this are, well, this is one of those things that motivated me as an art educator. Okay. I love seeing what other people are doing because I always want to learn and I want to be a better teacher every day. And I believe <laughs> that a lot of people are like that here tonight. I you know seeing other, what other people are doing. Amazing work you have you have done here. This is. Awesome. I have, I have more. It's, I can. It is awesome. <laughs> All right. If we go to um. Wait. Let me just find it. I want to go back to something. I thought I had a film here. I you. think I think we can just do that for another ten minutes. Then we can ask questions. I think that would be that would be better, sir. All right. So let me just go to my photo thing. Yeah, uh, I wanted to show these because they were very, very uh, exciting. These are the project that we had, I had just spoken about. And one of the fun things about this is like I said, when the students were doing them, they made their sketches and when they made the sketches, these were the rough parts of the sketches that they had to do. Um, and this is what I used to actually make the presentation. And I just wanted to show how that works. So the first thing that they did was they had to come up with like who those people were. So she has her dad, her auntie Peaches, her grandma Melon, Shane, uh, Dawson, Zoe, and Melissa. And then she had to write what she liked about them or what she thought about them. Then what she had to do was actually come up with how her design was going to work. And she decided she was going to get a picture of Ani Peaches and in all the details. And these are things where they were told to take uh, stock of who the person was, get everything that you know about them and bring that back. This would be the front of it. This would be the back of it. And then this would be the, uh, the actual uh, design of it altogether. And so that was the final one with her mom, which is really, really sort of cool. Um, let me just go back. And yeah, and what the way I traced it down is I actually created this thing called a scorecard. And so what I had to do was make sure that they understood what they were doing. I gave them this card to like make sure that they can check off what they have so that they can keep track of things. Uh, seventh grade students really don't really have a great idea how to keep track of things. So it's great to create something that keeps them on track. And I, I, I think of this as the same thing as when I'm working for a design firm and we're working on something big. All of our big projects have these tracking forms so that we know what's going on. And it's really important for us to like replicate that in the classroom so that they can get into that understanding and also hold their feet to the fire. Because one of the things is that I don't give them excuses. If they didn't bring in the photo, um, they can't go to the next step, which is creating the actual image of what's going to take place. And I find that being sort of very stringent in that way makes it a valuable lesson for them to understand what's going on. This young lady did a great job. That's her mother. And these are the things that she wrote about her. And that's the back of her card. That's her little sister and the things she wrote about her as well. Um, these are more details. Uh, again, the sketches and how those processes work out. These are like the important things that we should actually do all the time when we're working with our students. I find that a lot of the times uh, these are the things that the students pick up on later on because they can see how it uh, keeps them in line and takes them to another place in terms of like understanding how to get something done. When they do not succeed, I ask them about various things um, such as uh, I like to tell a story about um, if they were a person who 
got a job and they were told to do something in the job and they weren't successful at it and they were fired. Um, what would they think if someone fired them about, uh, you know, why would they, what would they think about someone firing them? And when they think about it, they think about the fact that somebody's paying you to do something and you didn't do it. And what I want them to think about is that when you're working on something like this, you're the one that's creating your reality. So, you know, you're creating something. This is the start of it right here. Um, this person had to find the picture, had to come up with all the ideas and stuff. My job as the teacher was to get the picture from them and to make a photocopy of it. And then the next thing was for this person to take that copy and put it into action and make it work for her. So what she did was draw her idea of what the outside of it is going to look like. And she dropped her photo in there and she used a lot of the details of the, the stuff that she had written over here to put on the back of it. You know, he was with special services and uh, all of these other things that go along with it. All of these things are amazing in terms of like looking at what's going to happen with the students later on. It's a very important thing and it's something that I can't express too much of because it's just very important. The other part of this was that the students had to choose someone that I and my co-teacher with the Park Avenue Armory thought they should know. So I chose for the students to do a card about Sidney Poitier. And because these students were seventh graders in New York City, um, they had no idea who Sidney Poitier was. So they had to go through the process, like process of learning who he was, coming up with the idea of like what they were gonna write on the back of the card to go along with that. But what I found was interesting in that process is that it, it clued them into like a lot of like understanding that they needed to have about a broader world out there. Because the important is something that I couldn't express to them, that um, they should understand like that will be important for them. Sidney Poitier was the first actual actor that I saw on television that was a black actor that looked sort of like me, that was doing something. And um, I found that to be transfixing as a seven-year-old or six, seven-year-old and, and seeing that this guy was an actor in a big movie. You know, that was back in those days. That wasn't, you didn't see a lot of that, especially in parts where he was a dignified individual. So it's very important for the students to look at things like that. And it's very important for us to like bring up things like that for them to actually make um, some sort of content and make their projects out of it. Okay, so I think that sort of covers everything that I wanted you guys to know about that kind of project. Okay. So, that is fantastic. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, let me just move this, okay. Okay. This person is um, leaving now. Okay, thank you so much for this wonderful presentation this evening. So we are going to open up um, question, uh, question for other people to ask questions. And now I can see, if you want to ask question, please, we can make use of the hand icon. I can see one already up, one hand already raised up using the hand icon. Well, if you still want to ask question, then you can put on your camera. If you can make use of the hand icon, you can put on your camera and wave your hand. Hopefully we can be able to get you to that too. So that's what we are going to do. So the first hand there is Mr. Oluwagbemiga Isaac. So, sir, you can go ahead and ask a question. You can unmute yourself. Sir, uh, Mr. Larry, can you, can you please uh, stop sharing your screen so I can share oh. something from my end now? Okay. Let me... Oh, okay, just... Allow. There you go. Good evening, the house. There you go. There you go. Okay. Yeah. <clears throat> Fantastic. Hello. Hello. Go ahead, sir. Go ahead. Go ahead. Oh. Um, I, I'm happy to be on the platform tonight. And sincerely speaking, I want to thank uh, our presenter, Larry J for giving us that uh, fa fantastic uh, presentation. Uh, indeed, I can see a lot of uh, uh, things in what you have shared with us tonight, and which I believe that uh, if all the 
all the art teachers or art educators in the house can emulate that, that we equally improve uh, I think the creative instincts of our students in our various schools. And likewise, uh, I think last week uh, the, the, the presenter that came equally you know, inspired many of us in a way. And uh, now we discover that uh, it is better we link up with others elsewhere in order to equally improve our own situation here. And um, I want to inquire from uh, Larry J. If, uh, if we intend to collaborate with you, bringing you into our classroom, will you be able to do that? <laughs> I'd love to do it. <laughs> oh, that's great. That's great. That would so, be excellent. I, I think uh, you, you should be expecting many of us in Nigeria now uh, invite, uh, inviting you into our classroom. Oh, you know, it'd, be, it'd be great. Uh, to share your experience with us and uh, likewise inviting us to your classroom as well to equally share our own uh, experience. Totally. I, I believe that uh, cross vitalization of ideas will go a long way to improve our uh, teaching and learning uh, situation here in this part of the world. Thank you so much for that uh, wonderful pre presentation. Uh, Thank you. You have done a good job. Thank you. Much appreciated. Uh, I have no qualms with going anywhere to do art. That's what I love to do. So that's, that'd be perfect. Any other questions? OK, thank you so much, Mr. Adi, uh, Lad Meji. Uh, can we have another person? Um, just that, and that is ways up. Can we have other people? OK, you can just unmute yourself to speak. OK, Mr. OK, Professor Shagun Lide. And yes. Today, so you can go ahead, sir. You can go ahead, sir. Uh, thank you. Um, I just have a very quick uh, question about bringing parents into the class or bringing the community into the class. The very first part of your presentation, you showed um, an architect or some architects in the room with the kids looking at the work that they did. Were they there during the course of creating those or just at the end? You know, what's great about that is that I had told the kids in the first week, I've, I've been lucky because I had a, a really, really wonderful person who was my, um, who was my, my funder for that project. I told them in the first week that if they wanted to come in, they should come in by week three to meet the kids. So those architects came in by week three, one or two came in over the course of the duration of the project. And then at the end, I said, you know, it's week 10. Can you guys all come in and let's uh, have like a little celebratory thing? Um, and they came in. So it's great to give them the invite to come in, but also have an open classroom. I love having an open classroom and it's really wonderful to have a guest come in while the kids are working. They don't stop working. I don't like the idea of like visitors coming in and being in a fishbowl. I like when the students are working in their teams and you wander over to them and ask them what's going on. And I never say what's going on. It's up to the team to tell you what's going on because they will tell you exactly where they're at. And that, that makes it very, very real. That last class where they have the celebratory thing, they're very excited to have like someone else that they met maybe four weeks ago or so. And that person is looking at the final product um, with some of the suggestions that they had given to them, as well as new ideas that they like branched on and improved upon. So it's, it's really relevant and very important. I like to have people come in. Well, thank you. That's yeah. really inspiring. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Sir. So we would like to have other people to make comments, uh, contributions, and also ask questions. So what we can do, if you can't use the hand icon, you can unmute yourself and speak. OK, Mr. Yusuf Abdul Asak can speak now. Mr. Yusuf. Hello. You need to unmute yourself, sir. 
Yusuf Abdul, uh, Dr. Yusuf Abdul Azak. Your hands is raised. You can unmute yourself and speak. Okay, you can go ahead. You are muted. You are, you are muted now. Okay. You can go ahead and speak, sir. I guess Dr. Yusuf is having an issue with uh, his computer. With the yeah, good there. evening, House. Yes. Oh, yeah. Good evening. Okay. If, if he's ahead, not sir. speaking, let me talk. Okay, yeah, good go ahead, evening. Sir. Go ahead, sir. Our guest speaker, Larry J. Good evening, sir. How are you? Yeah, I'm fine. Good. Um, really enjoy your all that you have been saying. And uh, I'm so fascinated with your studio setting, the facilities you have there, and the students you are teaching. I discovered what is the age range of these children? That's right. number one question. Okay. And how many of them do you have in the classroom? Great questions, great questions. Um, the age ranges from, as you can see, there were some beginners, uh, like second grade up in public school. And then I have a residency with a private school and my private school students are even what's called beginners. They're, they're like before first graders. And I work with them up to fourth grade. So I have that, but in well, public school, I, I was talking about, I work all the way I'm up to like the age. Grade. I want to know the age, their age. Oh, the age range. The range of the their age. The age range yes. is six and seven, all the way up to like, I work with college students as well, 20 year olds. And okay. in the classroom in public schools in New York City, you can have a classroom up to 35 students. So a lot of those classes, the reason why I have them in teams of like four and five is because there's a classroom of like 30 to 35 students. So there's like five teams working on five different pieces of architecture there. Um, okay. so and there are facilities, facilities for each of the students to work with. That's great. Yeah, it's fun. Um, it's, that's one of the challenges we have here in Nigeria. But we know that well, with the courage, with the with the courage and passion of our teachers in Nigeria, yeah, we will get there. Um, on the on our own side here, we have. Our classrooms are just too loaded, except private schools. I right. wouldn't know whether Mr. Sheikh will have um, anything less than 50, but in private schools here, you have about 120 okay. in, a in a class of about, um, what do I call it? About uh, 16 feet by 20 by 20. Right, so you squeeze. You have almost 100 students in that place. So, and teachers may find it even difficult to move around. Wow. And it, wherever we, we now, the places where they have art studio, they mm -hmm. have problems of accommodating the students as well because the art studios cannot contain all of them. Right. But what we see tonight is also challenging us and encouraging us that, well, we have a long way to go. And uh, we are not fed up anyway because we have the skills. <laughs> I right. know our our um, art institutions here and our curriculum are not really bad. They are, people are really up to the task to teach students. But uh, to, 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 to get to that level, you are, we have seen tonight, we need to really work hard. So we thank you for challenging us and motivating us as well with your passion, your courage, and all that you have been doing. We, we have really learned something tonight as well to add to whatever we have in our pool of knowledge. Thank you very much. Thank you. I appreciate that remark. I just want to say that due to the fact that we have COVID here in the U.S. in such a rapid environment, um, I've been designing a program or a project where, uh, just for myself, I've been playing with the idea of creating um, architectural structures for outdoor space 
because uh, our New York City schools are very crowded, as I just said, not as crowded as what you're working with, but the introduction of the idea to the school system that they should work in outdoor space has come to fruition. Hopefully they'll pick up on that fact. And what I've been doing is just creating ideas of what that could look like. And I want to actually have those as some of my first classes with students. Even if I'm working in the classroom with my students, I want them to work on an imaginary project where they imagine themselves working outside of the classroom, whether it's in a park, whether it's in a secluded section of a parking lot or on the streets or on the sidewalks. I want them to come up with ideas of what that space could look like if they could use that for an, um, an actual classroom space. And then I, what I want to do is I want to introduce that those, those ideas to the school system so they can just look at it and understand that it's an important thing that can be shopped out for students. And it's, it's relevant. It's relevant to like understand that learning takes place when you have the space to learn, but it also takes place when you're a part of like designing and understanding what that space could be as well. So let's further to make that possible. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Doctor, you see if you can take your question and comment now, sir. You are muted right now, but I don't know. We could, we can't hear you. Okay, while we are waiting. I just wanted okay. to add to um, what Dr. Adele had mentioned. When I was a okay, student in high school, we had to have a combined arts class. That is all the four classes will come out. We we'll all go into the dining hall. And those days we had dining halls and assembly halls. I don't know if schools still have those. So we go into the dining hall and that's where we had our art classes for the time that we had art teachers. Um, Sometimes it rains, you know, but being in the dining hall was a good shelter for us. Right. I don't know if that's still obtainable in Nigeria now with the way schools are being built, but um, could be another option. Uh -huh. yeah. yeah, it's important to look at the various spaces and see what they're being utilized as. And, you know, spaces don't have to do just one thing. They can work for you. Any other questions? Hello, am I being heard okay, now? Doctor, you should. Uh, good yes, evening. Yes, am I being heard now? now? Good evening. Yes, yes, go ahead, sir. Yes. Yes, go ahead, okay. sir. Okay. Go ahead. Uh, uh, sorry for that. I had to I had to so, again yeah, and come back and see what you connect properly. Uh good evening. Good evening, everyone hey. on board this evening. Uh, I'm happy to be here tonight, and uh, uh, what we have seen tonight is quite encouraging and uh, very creative. Uh, I just discovered that from what we saw last week and uh, what we saw today, the two appears to be similar. And my question is, um, uh, to me, it looks strange. How you are able to do this within the confines of uh, the curriculum? Because I discovered that you do all sorts of creative things within uh, the setup. And I feel that it appears that you go up an open-ended creative uh, drive to get what to be done to be done. Uh, for example, you start with drawing, we get some montage, and finally maybe some of the final outlet comes out in three-dimensional forms. And I wonder if um, how you are able to do it. Do you keep the curriculum in suspense? Because here when we teach, uh, when you're supposed to teach drawing, you teach drawing. When you are supposed to teach sculpture, you teach sculpture because the, the curriculum dictates some of the things that you are able to teach. Uh, I just want to know if you could benefit how people are able to do this drive to go through all sorts of different sorts of learning and with the outcome uh, coming in such a way that uh, I feel that it appears that uh, it's so open ended. So this is just my question. Thank you. Yeah, that's a great question. I um, 
I come from, my background is as an illustrator. I went to art school to be an illustrator. And uh, when I was probably 14 or 15, I was already published. Uh, I love to draw and I love to paint. Um, and when I was going to art school um, at 20 years old, I had a wonderful teacher who uh, instilled in me the idea that you don't have to paint on canvas if you don't want to. I hated painting on canvas because it took too long to dry and because it was expensive and I was not very, very rich. In fact, I was poor. So I was doing a lot of drawing on basic papers and I started drawing on, on top of um, uh, uh, paper bags. And I remember coming in with an assignment that was done on a paper bag and my teacher said, oh, that's brilliant. It's great. You, you wanted to start without having a ground. You didn't want to start with the white paper because it was scary or whatever. He put all of these things into like why I was drawing on a paper bag. I said, no, I'm drawing on a paper bag because I ain't got no money to get some good paper. And I found that like if the art is there, the art is going to be very, very rich. The subject matter that I was working with at that time was what I was looking at. I was looking at things on the subway and I was drawing them on that paper bag uh, because I loved looking at things and I was capturing it. So the art was rich and it was telling a story. Later on, when I started working with art um, uh, education, I started realizing that if I have a meeting with a teacher before our classes begin, if it's a 10-week residency and I'm meeting with a, a math teacher, I'm going to tell the teacher that I want to do architecture based on something. What are you studying? They can give me an idea of what they're studying and then I can slot in what it is that I want to do along with what they're doing based on a thematic thing, based on an architectural thing, based on a mathematic thing. It can be anything. I can make it work for us because when I work professionally, that's the way we work. When I work doing uh, window displays for Lord and Taylor, we would work with a theme and I would be working with a lighting person and I would be working with a person that's a sculptor as well as a painter and the design department. Nothing was just cut and dry. Nothing was just one way. So I try to make sure that the students as well as the teachers understand that in the new world that we work in and in the creative world that we work in, no one's really going to be made successful as a one trick pony. You have to know that you never start learning, you never stop learning, and that you have to be the motivator of learning new things. I taught myself the three-dimensional ARCHICAD program because I wanted to work with kids that I saw were getting more and more involved with game technology. So I taught myself the most complicated architectural program, ARCHICAD, so that I can start to work in schools with kids that were in second and third grade. And that's what you've been seeing when you see those three-dimensional models that the kids make out of on the computer. That program is a $4,000 software program that I got a license to, to teach, um, a license to teach free in schools and public school because ARCHICAD thought it was so valuable for the kids to know that like this does exist. And because the teachers should know that as well. What we're getting from the schools right now, and one of the things that I try to rail against is this ideology that you can't do this and you can't do that. I think you have to approach things on a multiple basis of like understanding what's being learned. And so um, if you're an educator, you're gonna have to start explaining that to the powers that be. I know how hard this is, but I think it's very important for them to understand that when people are working every day out there, no one's working just doing one thing, not in the creative field anyway, working doing one thing and thinking that that one thing is what they're going to do for 30 years and get a gold watch and somebody's going to pat them on the back and say you did a wonderful job. doesn't happen. With technology growing and growing and learning and learning, we have to incorporate that into our classrooms as well. Sorry that was long-winded, but I felt it. <laughs> That is wonderful. Um, I don't know if we have more questions and comments to take. We can just go ahead and unmute our mic. Let's see the first person to do that. Sorry, there's one. Go Sorry, there's still one critical area. Sorry, there's still one critical area. I just, I just need to confirm. Are you hearing me? Yeah, I get you. Hello? Yes, go ahead. Yeah, 
I, I I talked about the curriculum, but I don't know whether some of those things were based on the curriculum or, or was it an out of curriculum? You bounced out at the end of that. You're gonna have to say it again. I guess what, what he was trying to say uh, what, that what? all what you discussed with us tonight. Was it all about, was it in the, the curriculum or is it just the teacher's uh, innovative idea to go with that? With the models that you saw at the very beginning, the curriculum was for the students to understand architecture in um, New York. So what they had was like a, a thing where they showed the, the students a couple of pictures of like um, longhouses from like the 1800s. And then like townhouses from the 1880s and then like uh, buildings from the 30s, like the Empire State Buildings and then modern day structures. And that was basically because they were studying the history of New York. And then what the students did when I worked with them was I asked them to like take the summary of what they thought they wanted to do based on one of those flavors, basically, of like what period they wanted to choose. And then we would make an architectural model based on that, um, those principles. So they did that. Um, so it's broad based idea of like uh, using the subject matter with the thematic um, and uh, I give them the latitude to do their research, come up with picture sources and they have to verify what they know before they even begin the process of it. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, can we have Dr. Babasha Ide Ademu Lewa? Ademuleya, thank you very much, uh, yeah. Larry J. Sorry about that, sir. No, 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 it's, don't worry. Um, thank you, Larry J, for your, for your discussion tonight. Uh, we want to really appreciate you. Um, the question um, Abruzak asked the other time, I think which has to do with the issue of curriculum. Actually, my, my encouragement to teachers is to be a bit um, creative with teaching. When I say creative with teaching, I mean our curriculum at times, the way we have it here, may, may actually put us in the kind of, if we are not careful. So all it takes is for us to look beyond, think out of the box mm -hmm. and look beyond and how perhaps we're we'll able to, to achieve some of these things so that our students will be interested in what we, they are doing. And if the students are able to identify with the products, so as so much that they could take the product home, their parents also will be interested in what they do. Again, um, there may be need for us at times to actually walk out of the box in the sense of um, creating a kind of a weekend art class, art forum sort of, because most of these things could easily be achieved in a free environment mm -hmm. where the students are not restricted by hour. Uh, you, will, you only have your contact hours of 45 minutes, 30 minutes one hour for you to walk. It shook the students up, but if you if you are able to maybe you have a kind of a weekend once in a month weekend in which you interact with students, and they can come with the different materials. They have fun. They, they all stay for for longer hours because these issues of creativity is not something you can restrict. Some are not uh, good. I mean, early starters. Some are late starters. They don't get to understand it until they get into the middle of the game, and it is when they get to the middle of the game you tell them start telling them time up, time up and then um, you discourage them. So my, my suggestion actually is that for us who are this end of the world, which we, we one, we lack facilities, we uh, the parents are not encouraging, students themselves are not so much interested. The few ones that are interested, we can pull them out for weekend uh, retreats, sort of, and they organize one way or the other in which they can have more time because this requires more time more time and then we source for materials. We can also try as much as possible to provide some of the materials they use so that they can get familiar with it. But if you are thinking about working within the curriculum around this period, I mean, within, uh, within our own setting, where you have um, restricted minutes for, for a particular class, it's just about 30 minutes, 40 minutes, and people are eager to chase you out of the class because you don't even have a studio. So those are the problems you may have, but if you pull them out of the normal curriculum setting or system, it can be something that you take from the curriculum and then you create a period, maybe a free period, a time where you will lose a bit and you can be free with creativity. 
they can enjoy themselves because if they don't enjoy what they are doing, forget about it. They just have to be enjoy whatever they are doing. They must see it as fun as well so that they can be open to it and their minds can be open as well. Thank you. Yeah, that's a very good point. Um, another thing that, that should be mentioned is the importance of having those students that are doing art um, uh, be in the presence of actual artists, visiting other studios, having artists come into the actual place that they're working in and um, showing their stuff and working with them on projects and also just going to museums and and just looking at things and then thinking about like making your own version of those things when i was seven eight years old i was going to galleries and looking at things and trying to replicate them and spending hours wondering about them that curiosity is something that our students don't have because it's not being taught and they don't have such as what you said, the freedom to do that. It's our jobs, my job as an educator, to instill in them the idea to look outside the box. I'm, I'm always outside the box, but also be curious, ask questions, be resourceful, and definitely don't accept what you think to be true. Go to the source, find out why it is, understand it, and really get into it. Um, and that's very important. It's very important. Thank you for sharing. Thank you so much, sir. Um, uh, we have Dr. Ido. Thanks up. You can unmute yourself, sir. sir. You can unmute yourself, sir. Dr. Ido. Yeah, good evening. Oh, good evening, good sir. Good evening. I want to come behind uh, Dr. Demulea for uh, what he said, that we should go beyond the normal class routine. I think uh, we should also add to uh, what we are doing, what we call a, a discovery drive. Discovery drive in the sense that there are younger ones that are interested in the uh, arts per se. And uh, because we don't have discovery drive, they are only restricted to classroom setting. They will have contact with us, maybe during the school session. And when the school session is over, nobody is talking to them about art any longer. So those of us who are professionals, those of us in the arts, uh, I think uh, there is need for us to employ discovery drive. So that when we see these younger ones who have the talent, who have these uh, creative talents, we can encourage them, we can develop them, we can help them to grow. And from there, we can have more of them coming up and they'll be showcasing their own uh, creativity. And um, we as teachers too, that is as educators, we also need to open our eyes and see what goes on in the society. Because we know that, like we said, we mentioned the parents the parent syndrome, this discouraging syndrome, the society discouraging syndrome, and some other syndromes that are militating against the development of art. They are part of what we need to fight. Because in the, in the developed countries, they have atmosphere that is so conducive for training. But here, uh, art is being looked down upon. Uh, people look at it as a... Uh, we work with them by only talented ones. We cannot develop it. And that is what we should try to erase from the mind of people. And it depends on the way we approach it as well. So we also need to engage in discovery drives. When we do that, I think uh, we can get improvement. And uh, even with improvisation, we can also take all these younger ones to the level they want to be. Okay, I didn't really get the gist of the end of that. Um, can you sum it up for me? Uh, what, what I was trying to say mm -hmm. is, the, the, I mean discovery drive. Some of these younger generations that are interested in art, right. they, are over there, they, are, they look at over the places, but they only have opportunity of uh, having art in the classroom. And when they leave the classroom, nobody is talking about it again. But those of us who are the practitioners, the artists, the art educators, we are able to identify social, we should encourage them. We should allow them to use uh, 
um, when they could find around them to develop their creativity. I don't know that. We can get more people into uh, parties of art instead of waiting until uh, maybe they are made before they make them, art, they make them artists. No, we shouldn't wait until they are made. We can develop them from their own creativity to whatever level they want to go. It depends on educa- art educator. That is our focus. That should be our focus, and that is what we should be doing. Getting those who are interested. I think we call it uh, uh, um, creative, creativity drive for those who do not have uh, the talent at all. Those who do not have the talent can be made to become an expert too. Like uh, Dr. Demley I mentioned, that we should go beyond the classroom setting. Okay. I, I like to think that the classroom setting is a place for exploring your understanding of solving problems. So I use art to solve problems, and I love when the students and the teachers work together in doing that. Um, And I find that, um, I think that way because when working professionally, it's always been a sharing thing. And um, I'm trying to make sure that our students are not discouraged by some people are good at math, some are good at science, some are good at social studies. I was a lousy math student, um, and I thought I was a bad student, but it was just that it wasn't being taught to me in a way where I understood it. But when I look at mathematics in terms of like um, something like mixing color, that's a math class for me, you know? Uh, you know, 30% red into white will make a various uh, variation of pink. If I put 50% into different variation, I can explain that to students. When working with architecture, I can bring a ruler out and I can break the ruler into like what um, a quarter is, what a half is, you know, what a whole is, and base it on like what it means in terms of money. A half dollar is half of whatever, uh, half of one is 50, you know, all of those things. It's, it's another language, the visual arts medium, but it's the same language in every art. I work with dancers. And when I work with dancers, I work with them in the same way as I work with a person who's um, working on the stage, uh, um, you know, doing choreography. We talk about composing the look of what's going to go on. You know, it's the same thing. When you're composing a picture, you're figuring out how the balance is going to look. It's the balance of the dance on the stage, what's happening on the right, what's happening on the... All of these things, it's it's another language that that hasn't been explained because everything's being explained in one or two different channels that people have deemed to be the only way that people are going to learn. I don't believe that to be true. I think we learn and our students learn from multiple sources at all one time. And we have to channel it into whatever it is that that we can figure is gonna work best for the audience that we're working with. That's why I can work with young people, I can work with old people, I can work with anybody. Um, And that's one of the things that I, I, I thought was my gift in terms of getting out of art school, thinking I'm just going to be doing studio work and make my living as just an artist that lives in a turret and do all this stuff and never touch base with people. Well, I miss working with people. And it was great to like bring myself into this realm of thinking I can teach some of what I know to them to make them see what it is that I see and how to see it a little bit differently and to be positive with that. Thank you very much. Let's have uh, Professor Shagun Lude. Uh, thank you. I'm really enjoying this because I'm getting a lot of information from it, um, especially you know, the contributions that we're getting. Um, helps me to think through some of the questions we've had in the past. Um, Larry and Holly, uh, before you joined us, we were talking about the value of art and art education. Um, for some weeks and we were trying to itemize what the value of art education would be and the way you've explained it you know using um, art to explain things to dancers to explain things in mathematics to bring it into architecture it really makes sense to have a more wholesome view of what art education can be or what it is because it's um, intricately entwined into life itself, so to speak. Um, 
But one of the questions that keep coming up again and again is the fact that parents tend to be discouragers. <laughs> Some parents, maybe more parents. Um, what you've done in your class is really stimulating for me because you bring the parents into the class to sit with their kids and look at their final project and they get to see other children doing the same thing. They get to meet other parents. They start to see the importance and the value of art education. Even if it's in a small setting like that, I think it's quite um, interesting that mm -hmm. you were able to bring the parents into that setting and have them have a taste of what art education is. I just wanted to make sure that I mentioned or highlighted that before this is over. Thank you. Thank it's, you. it's very important to do that as well. Um, okay. You know. Okay, thank you so much, Saz. In fact, this has been a wonderful moment. And uh, I think I, I would like to say that this has this this will transform what I've been doing over the years in the sense that I have learned so much even from the the last two uh, sessions that we had the one from early and the one we had today it's wonderful i wish that other art educators around africa are here tonight to 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 witness this and to also learn from this because this is highly inspiring and motivative in fact it is it is a great exposure for my own end and i, I know very soon to professor shagun i will be contacting you larry and uh, uh ali because I, in my school, we engage in virtual teaching and I can invite you just like we're having it tonight to my class. So I, I don't know if this week will be possible or next week, but that will be communicated privately with you. I will get your contact from Professor Olude because I would love you to showcase this with my students. Sure. And most of the time, most of the time when they have the class online, most of the time their parents are also with them. So at the parents, because I want to send messages to the parent as well, and I want them, I want those kids to uh, to to have this particular exposure that we had tonight, because they can also communicate to their parents that they want to engage more in art. In my school, art is just for like four, 40 minutes, uh, uh, 80 minutes each week. That, that is double period, and mm. that is 80 minutes. You can imagine for a week. That we all we could get for a week in the school. So most of the work we have done maybe after school hours, you know, sometimes weekends. So that's what we have been doing. But right. I think they need to see even uh, even this video we make it available for other people to actually learn from it. And I thank God we have a recording, a recorded video of this tonight because other people need to see this. This is a wonderful one, and I want to say thank you to Professor Shagun Lude for making this happen for all of us, uh, for bringing Larry Jackson tonight and also for bringing Ali Ossi last week. This is a wonderful uh, moment. And I uh, will just take one last comment from uh, Mr. Oluwagbemiga. Then, uh, Ms., uh, Professor Larry, you give us a, 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 a parting word tonight. Sure. Then, and then probably there is going to be part two or part three of this, of this session with you. I hope that we can make that happen for us. No we can problem. Should have part two or part, and even part three. Uh, same thing with Oli. I and I believe she can also hear me tonight. So uh, I will leave. Uh, Miss, uh, Mr. Olubemi, Lu guy, you can speak now. Then we have the last comment from Larry Jackson before we go tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, wonderful, wonderful. It has been an exciting moment. All true. And I want to thank uh, uh, Professor Sengolude for a job well done. And likewise, our guest tonight, uh, Larry Jackson. Thank you so much. Um, before I contribute uh, the little that I want, um, issues on discouragement from parents, and the uh, lack of facilities and some other things have been on for so long a time. And I could remember many years ago when I met uh, uh, Professor Segulude, he said 
stop lamenting about inadequacies, but look for a way to improve the situation by, you know, improvisation or some other things that we can do to improve the situation anyway. Well, I think um, curriculum is just a minimum standard, but not all. There are a lot of things that can be injected into curriculum. And um, uh, which I believe that uh, this thing is open-handed for the art educators to now use their discretion to improve their own profession in a way. And um, we need to encourage uh, curiosity on the part of our students and likewise allow fluidity fluidity form and look for a way to inspire them in diverse way we can uh, i could remember many years ago a friend of mine became artist just because he brought a flask of food to the classroom and then the teacher now looked around and said okay your uh, food flask is what they are going to draw today and eventually the one who brought the flask through this uh, flask in such a way that it was amazing. And then the art teacher now said, oh, this is wonderful. And that, that was just the only thing that inspired that uh, little boy that very day. And now he's a professional artist today living on arts. Well, what am I saying is that on the part of uh, uh, among us uh, problems that we are facing in this part of the world, I think uh, we need to have a word with the authority to be. And uh, if it will be possible, inviting people from outside the country into such a, a fora where they will be able to talk sense to some authorities that are not even helping the matters at all. I want to believe that this thing will not just happen uh, without a sacrifice is going to cost us some things. Uh, I believe that where there is a will, there is always a way. I believe we can do, we can move mountain if only we can join forces together. So uh, tonight, once again, I'm highly inspired and um, uh, as a the convener of this uh, program earlier said that uh, we get your contact through our dear uh, prof there. So I think uh, we are in a safe hand. Thank you so much and God bless you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, yeah, I couldn't have said it better. I, I love what you uh, just outlined. I just want to leave with a parting thing that I think is important, especially as we, we start discussing about parents and um, uh, that aspect of everything. Uh, as I was telling Alude uh, earlier today, I, I, I've been very fortunate to be um, able to design shows, culminating shows for, for projects that I've worked on. And I find the importance of them to be huge and the reason why I think that way, I trace it back to like being five years old, going to school, not liking school, not understanding why I had to leave my home to go to this place in kindergarten and sit around with people I didn't know, whatever. And I would just go into my own world and make pictures all day long while I was in school. I think school was from nine to 12 o'clock, but it felt like it was the longest day every day. And I remember getting home every afternoon and uh, running up to my mother and presenting her with a piece of paper with something on it. And she would take it and say, oh, what'd you learn in school? I was like, I, I wanted to come home. <laughs> That's what I learned. I wanted to come home. Uh, she would take my paper, which was some sort of a drawing or something, and put it on the refrigerator. And I found that to be comforting and relaxing. 
The next day I'd go to school, I'd do the same thing. The teacher was talking, blah, 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 blah. Things are going on in the classroom. I'm not making friends, but I had my piece of paper. I had my pencil, my crayon. I was making something. I get home, I present that piece of paper. My mother would put it on the, 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 the refrigerator. Later on, over the course of the week, I'd get home and I saw my whole week was laid out right there. And she would ask me, what did I learn? And I could look at the picture that I made and tell her what I was thinking about. To me, I learned a lot more than what was really going on in school. I had already knew how to read and stuff. And I found that school wasn't speaking to me. That's why I wasn't engaged. I was engaged because I was like thinking ahead of everything. And so I'm thinking now with our students in school, we don't know who's really there a lot of the times because a lot of them are coming in with that mask on their face. You have to come in with whatever your passion is and show them that you're as excited to be here as they should be as well. Because the importance of being there should be passed along to them. I don't regret not liking school. I just loved when I liked the parts of school that I liked. And it was usually because I had a great teacher that understood who I was. And when they were talking to me, they were listening to me and they were really, really caring about what it was I was thinking about or what I wanted to know. What that did for me was just verify the importance of being there now. I tell this to my students every class I go to, be here now. Don't complain about problems that are going on with your group. Work it out. If you can't work it out, figure out how you need to ask me or other teacher or someone else in the classroom or the group to help you understand what's going on. Otherwise, it's going to build up and it's going to be inside of you and it's going to stop you from going forward. Every day should be perpetually going forward. And that's what I think art does for you when you make it and it's put in front of you. You may not like what you did, but you also understood that that thing that you did made you move into another direction to understand why you don't like that or why you do like that. So I'm going to use more of that. I'm going to use less of that and then understand what the next thing is going to be better because I learned from that. You learn from doing. And so what I like to think has to go on in the classroom is that we have to do more with the kids where it's hands on, it's conversations, it's looking at, it's discussing and having the thing talk to them. And then they talk about it and they can really relate to what's taking place in front of them. And this is great if their parents are there to see it happen. The reason why I brought parents into the classroom is because with that last class, the kids are excited with the fact that they worked on a computer. They've never done anything on a computer where they were actually constructive making something. They're usually doing it and they're usually consuming something. I want them to be designers and think about whatever is being done on a computer. Somebody made you entertained. Why don't you create something to entertain other people? That's what I've been doing all my life. And that's what I do for a living. And that's what I set out to do when I was in art school. The only reason why I got into education was because I thought about the teachers, especially my art teacher in seventh and eighth grade that said, you're really special in that way. You, you can like articulate what's going on. You just have to get it out there and don't let all this other stuff bother you. And through a lot of pain and sorrow, I got through school, got into art school. When I went into art school, it was like going to heaven. It was a beautiful place. I want to say the last thing is that real world problems are to be solved by the students that are in school today. Those students learn from all the things that they're uh, that's approaching them all day long. They're learning from apps. They're learning from games. They're learning from um, how to's and documentaries. If they're smart, they're learning from those things. If they're just consuming them, then they're victims of not knowing what needs to take place in the future. They won't get a great life out of that because what's going to happen is those people that realize that they can do something and make something happen will be rewarded and they will be given a pass to go on to the next part of life that takes care of them. And I think that that's what education is all about. That's what we need to instill in the students. That is so important. And it's so important for the parents to know that we're doing that as well. So anytime you can get parents to come in and work with the students and see what the students are doing, let's do that. Thank you. Thank you to everybody that was here. And thank you guys for inviting me. Um, Bravo. Uh, before we go tonight, I just realized that it has been men talking all this while. And we have some ladies in the house. Mm -hmm. Probably one lady should just speak. 
and we have Elizabeth from Namibia. Elizabeth, can you just unmute yourself? Or Oli from uh, United States, uh, you can just unmute yourself. And so it will not just be all men tonight. So all men appear tonight. So we need them to just add their own um, voice to what we have discussed tonight. Thank you. Definitely. Yeah, Ollie, think, you can go ahead. Yes. Yeah, I think there's really nothing like what Larry talked about with his small groups in a crowded classroom, working as a team, or and parents coming in and teachers not trying to say what's happening, uh, adults in the room not trying to say. Let the students speak naturally about the process, and it fills the parents with pride to see that they're articulating this process that they really love to be engaged with. And I think that's the, one of the most important things because it shows the students we trust them, we trust their process, we want to hear from them. And I mentioned last week when my high school kids get together to do peer-to-peer -peer roundtables and they open their portfolios and their portfolios can have a science project, it can have a mathematical project, it can have a creative writing or poetry, or it can be art. And to look at it in the artist's way, critique and revision, and, and, and then in the end, as Larry said, get that work on the refrigerator, you know, get, get it into some kind of gallery show. This is the artist process. So we know when the student sees their work handled in a special way and put up, they will naturally speak about it. And that is, that's the part of the process they'll own. Yeah, Thank you, Larry. It was great today to see more of your work. Thank you. That was excellent. I had so much fun. <laughs> well, by Elizabeth. Elizabeth, you can unmute yourself and make your contribution to Elizabeth. Yeah. Here I am. Oh, right. Here you are. <laughs> okay. Uh, I'm just really thankful and I like the whole presentation um, from the how he created the environment with his students and everything, how he used his creative teaching to, to touch everything in uh, his uh, every student in his uh, class. I just like it because I'm also a student who is learning about art and maybe I will go back to teaching again. So I just like the whole thing. Thank you. Uh, and and what I wanted to ask, I, I was uh, I just wanted to ask on the on the questions that were raised. Um, are we going to take care of those questions by next Sunday? Hello. Hello. On the question that were raised, the 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 questions, the questions, the questions on. Uh, what does the future of art look like in the one? I didn't get the question. Yeah, me too. Same here. I didn't get the question. You didn't <coughs> get the question, eh? I am asking about the, the questions that were raised. Uh what does the future of the art look like and uh oh, and how oh, the role oh, of oh, art the evolve? Uh future. Evolve? Mm -hmm. You, the future of art, what it looks like? Yes. You want to know what I think about it? Yes. I think that one of the key things is that we have to, um, we're talking from wherever we are. We're in our little pod spaces, right? We're blasting okay. through little wire through space and we're speaking and I see you. That was something that 20 years ago was on Star Trek, a television show or a movie. Uh, it was space age, right? We are in a time where we can do whatever it is that we think we need to do if we put our minds and our resources to it. And, you yeah. know, one of the key things is that the students that we have, some of the students don't realize that because they don't know what it's like when you had to make a phone call and you had to put a dime in a thing and dial this thing and put it to your ear and all these other things that are going on. It's going to be a changed world. But if they don't have yeah. the 
ability to keep their imagination fertile and real and be here now and think about what could happen because they're accepting what's already in front of them. That's sort of like the end of civilization in a lot of ways. And so what we have to do as educators is to accept and understand that these things that we have are just tools. This computer is like a big pencil for me, right? This computer yeah. is a giant paintbrush. It's like the, the paints, mixing the paints. I use it towards yeah. that. But it originally starts right here because I still have an encyclopedia. I can like look up something. I don't need electricity to make something special. When I go to the beach, I can take my finger and draw in the sand. I don't even need a stick. I want mm -hmm. students to know that about themselves. You don't need to have all of this stuff. It is within you to bring it out and be resourceful. If the caveman never figured out that, wow, it's cold here and I need to get warm, nobody would have discovered fire. You know, fire is like, let's rub this thing. Oh, look at that way. Hey, hey, right. All of a sudden that guy's valuable. Okay? <laughs> you got to make yourself valuable. And so mm -hmm. students need to know that it's within them to be valuable, but they can't accept that everything is taken care of and that they're secure and safe, yeah. whatever. So the future is about that. And it's about creating apps. It's about making documentaries about stories within yourself or in your mm -hmm. life. It's about looking at the history of who you are, where you're mm -hmm. from, or what you don't know and what you want to shine a light on. It's painting a picture in everything that you want to do with the tools that are available to you. You know, mm -hmm. originally I went to school as an illustrator thinking I was just going to be on a magazine cover making images for magazine covers. And it's gotten so much broader than that. And if I just limit myself to that, I wouldn't have a job today. So I think that's what the future is. Wow. Sorry, wow. Sorry if I may say Hello? Okay. okay, go ahead, sir. Go ahead, sir. Uh, go sorry, ahead. Just, to, just to chip in this. Um, I think we, we bother too much about tomorrow. We should concentrate more on the present, the now. How, what can we do now to solve problems now, now, instead of thinking about it. the future will take care of itself. So let's talk about now. Thank you. You're valuable as to what's going on now, right? That's very good. Mm -hmm. <laughs> bravo, bravo. We can go on and on and on. But what <laughs> happens is that we have spent about uh, uh, an hour and 40 minutes mm -hmm. and we need to go tonight. We need to <laughs> hang it there and uh, continue next week. It's getting more interesting. I love every bit of it tonight. The the discussion, the conversations, the comments, the questions, everything, you know, is like a food of my own soul. You know, I'm 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 filled tonight. In fact, I don't need to eat tonight again. I'm filled. And I want to say thank you to everybody that are part of it. This is wonderful. On this note, I would like to say. Bye bye to all of us. We can unmute our mic and say good uh, good night. Bye bye. Bye bye. bye, -bye. bye, -bye. bye, -bye. Next, week, next week. Bye bye. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye bye. 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 Bye b